Um, so my name is Amilka Palmer, um, and um, just by way of introduction, I uh, will first thank you for coming, um, and JT, thank you for inviting me, inviting us. us yeah. um, I just just to place myself with um, Third World Newsreel as an organization. Um, I am an alum of the production workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else in this in the room? Okay, um, and I that was um, I think it was 1998. Really? So a good 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, that I took that production workshop. Um, JT taught sound. Herman Liu uh, taught camera and lighting, um, and we're in Herman's department. Um, and so I just wanted to really actually thank that organization because I really timed that with my start in this field, um, my beginnings. Mm. Um, and so I, I've been working in documentary for that many years, more or less, and have worked on a range of projects. I kind of worked myself up from a production assistant to an associate producer, field producing work. Um, uh, and now what I do is I go back and forth between archival producing for documentaries and producing um, two very different types of work, um, but we're here to talk about the producing, the archival producing piece. And just in terms of some of the projects I've worked on, I worked on a series called African American Lives um, with Henry Louis Gates Jr., um, The Murder of Emmett Till, um, which was made down the block um, at Firelight Media with Stanley Nelson, um, and uh, another documentary called Sweet Honey in the Rock, Raise Your Voice, which was on American Masters. It was about the acapella um, singing group and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, we're, we're going to show some of our other work as well. But mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so also thank you for coming out and listening to us share our, our love for <laughs> searching, going on a detective mission to find images and, and uh, mm -hmm. documents and things that can help tell the story of, of documentary. So I also have a long relationship with Third World Newsreel. Uh, both as a, a place that I did archival research for a film I did called Cuban Roots Bronx Stories that we'll show a little um, trailer of. And Third World Newsreel is also the distributor of that, that film. So that's, that's great. Um, I first got excited about digging for old photographs when I was in high school. And I didn't realize it. I just I was assigned a, a research paper, and I was doing. I was living in Detroit. I grew up in Detroit, and I, I was assigned a research paper. So I was doing a paper on the la labor history, and so I went to the Walter Ruther Archives, which is at Wayne State University, and they gave me these folders, and I just had no idea. I was I guess I was 16 or 17. I just I was blown away by seeing these photographs of immigrant women, factory workers on the Lower East Side that, and I just imagine, oh, that's probably what my grandmother looked like when she was 15 and working in a factory. And, and I just, uh, it, it just dawned on me that, you, that it, it, it took me back in time and I, I fell in love with that idea of kind of being able to telescope back and, and, and kind of feel a connection to the past in that way. So I kind of took that interest and love with me as I began teaching here in New York City in, in the Bronx and throughout the 80s and as I started doing video production work with teenagers and so really using the community as a source of, of story and validating the voices in the community and seeing what, what did the community have to share in terms of story but photograph and, and documents that would help um, the students learn about history and then form their own their own stories around that. So that's how I came to actually doing uh, film work was through teaching history in, in this high school in the South Bronx. So the, the work that I've done in addition to working with students have all involved archival research from a film called Disobeying Orders, GI Resistance to the Vietnam War, which Look, told the story of several veterans who came back from Vietnam and joined the anti-war movement. So using photographs that they had, 
photographs from the Tamament archives, um, GI newspapers, that, underground newspapers that were being produced in the 60s on the army bases, things like that. Um, then I, I did a film called Cuban Roots Bronx Stories, which is a mix of personal story and larger political and, and um, cultural history of Cuba and the US, and it's through the eyes of um, an Afro-Cuban family. That's my husband's family. So that was also a mixture of personal photographs, documents, passports, visa, visa documents, immigration papers, um, and official, more quote official kind of um, um, archival material. And I had the experience then of working both in archives here and in, in Cuba. So that, that was interesting. Um, yeah, and then there, there are other examples that you'll see. But basically, all, all, all of my work involves personal stories that then get, um, that drive me to look for images and documents and ephemera that, that fill out that, that story. And so when I uh, embarked on uh, Detroit 48202 and got funding, I knew I would approach Amilka, as <laughs> I love to look for, and I found mm -hmm. a lot of valuable uh, material, but then working with a real professional in terms of organizing that material and licensing that material is a whole other uh, level. So it was great to work together on that. And, and I, I'm, I just wanted to make a, just because this is a, a, a reality um, around um, working in this industry, I think that um, it has been helpful to have these skills for me, and actually Anne, I consider one of my teachers here, so thank you very much for being here. Um, but having these skills I think is super important, so I'm excited to hear that people are really interested in, in this as a career possibility, um, or doing it in tandem with work um, in just as makers. Um, I have found that, and this is a side note, I have found that it has allowed me to work, to, to kind of sustain a little bit better uh, a livelihood in the documentary film community, having this skill. And also, I think it's really important that there are uh, people of color doing this work um, for all kinds of reasons, um, but this is an area that I think we need to have more um, you know, women, African-American women, um, women of color doing this work. Um, and so I'm just really encouraging uh, not to exclude anybody else who's interested in it, but to really um, see it as a possibility um, and a way of kind of making a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we, um, I, I think JT was going to operate this. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Just, we wanted to kind of get a working definition going about what is archival, what are we talking about when we say archival? And again, this is archival for documentary. Um, it's a loose term, and it's important that we, it's not gonna be, there's not gonna be like a hard and fast definition, um, but we wanna just start getting some ideas out on the table. Um, so the first, okay. We're talking about footage and moving images. Um, we're talking about audio recordings and sound recordings, and we're talking about photographs, still imagery, and then an important category is something called ephemera, which is the, the, the materials that are produced and published that are not necessarily meant for the long term, that are like a newspaper, it's disposable, you know, or uh, less is disposable now because so much is online, right? But newspapers traditionally <coughs> would be um, printed and tossed. But um, I, newspaper headlines, movie posters, um, billboard charts for some of the music documentaries you might be participating making, um, census records, letters, these are kinds of the ephemera that you might think about that can help, um, that become kind of visual material for um, a film. Now, some notes about this kind of, this kind of material. Um, it may be part of an organized collection, but it's also equally possible that it would not be part of an organized collection. So that it might be found in a research library or in an old shoebox at the top of somebody's closet. And so you want to think about that 
um, both present obstacles, um, but also present all this tremendous possibility. Um, so that's really exciting. And I would say, particularly as you work with individuals who you are reaching out to, to you know, basically the, ca the characters, the people who you're collaborating with in your film projects, you really want to see them as like a resource um, for archival material, childhood photographs, family letters, the kinds of things that they may not themselves have, but people in their circle might have. Um, the other point to make is that archival is not necessarily old. Um, and this is important. It simply means previously recorded or captured. And, and I make this distinction because I work on projects frequently that are about contemporary issues. I worked on a film called The Great Invisible, which was about the Deepwater Horizon um, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and in that case, we were gathering a lot of archival material that was not capital H historic, historical material. It just was material that had been, you know, recorded the prior month um, or year or, or recent years. Um, and so at its core, this term, it really is used, at least in day-to-day -day use, um, to distinguish your original material, so the stuff that you're shooting that you actually are creating and producing yourself, that you actually have the, that you own, um, from other people's work. Um, and the implications of this are pretty significant. The implications are kind of obvious. One, you have to find it, right? How do you do that? And then two, um, you don't own it. So how do you either get permission or, um, you know, f figure out the rights to use other people's material? Mm -hmm. And just, to, just so you know, some of these are clips and actually some of these are trailers and trailers are, are edited in a very particular way to sort of entice or to summarize a story. Um, but you can even just, if as you're watching, um, just keep an eye toward the archival um, and, and even see how heavily um, documentary can, can lean on the archival material. Um, the next clip is from a, a, a documentary series that I worked on as an archival producer um, that just aired on Showtime, um, and it's called uh, Wu-Tang Clan of Mikes and Men, um, directed by um, uh, Sasha Jenkins. Um, maybe we can bring some of these examples up, uh, and, and, or if there, well actually first, is there any reactions or thoughts or anything that stood out? Happy to, you know, as it pertains to this conversation. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot. I just assume that you're going to speak more, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, afterwards I would. What did you just say? I said I, I have a lot of questions, but I just assume that. Yeah. After, I, I, I maybe mean, you would answer the questions at the end. Sure. Because I have a lot of technical questions about legalities and mm -hmm. um, most important factor and like, um, that kind of stuff. So I should just wait. Yeah, maybe that's after. Sure. I think okay, cool. we're also interested in kind of um, just a response to the use of the materials and, mm -hmm. and how they, they if there if it, if there are responses. Otherwise it's yeah. okay. There's a comment. I mean I have to say because it's great archival work, but how did you obtain that? What process did you have to go through to okay. get those archives? Okay. It's that's great how you guys put it together, but yeah. I think I want to know. Yeah. That's and the cost. I actually had a, just a reaction or, or a, a, a reflection on the first, um, some of the, the archival footage in the Emmett Till piece. And the thing is that archival material is not neutral. And I listened to the, there was news footage. And so the newscaster is referred to um, the, um, the white woman as the attractive wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then it referred to um, Emmett Till's uncle's house as a shack. Mm -hmm. So as a filmmaker, you're, you want the, the images, but there's also, the, but there's, there's, um, there's judgment within ev every piece of uh, material that we're, we're looking at. And, and so sometimes you may want to critique. You know, using, you're, using, you're using material in a way that invites you as a filmmaker or invites the audience to not, not just look at it as, as an image, but that everything carries with it a point of view. Mm -hmm. So I thought that, was, that jumped mm -hmm. out at me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. also with the Emmett Till footage, we've seen a lot of that footage for the last you know, 20, 30 years. So how does a filmmaker now take that footage that we've seen so often and then make it a new and inviting piece? So I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Especially, well, like some of the work you had, of course, with the, um, in the Cuban, with the, which I thought was amazing. I didn't know that they had somebody reading to them. and um, That was so new to me. But as I said, some of the footage that we've seen, we've grown up with so many years, how do you make it fresh and mm -hmm. how do you make it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell your own story? Mm -hmm. And just a, a quick comment on that. I mean, the, the work that's up there is sort of the collaborative effort of an archival producer, of a director, um, of a writer sometimes, um, and certainly of an editor. Um, so in terms of like how, where that collaboration really comes together is oftentimes how you see um, old materials or usual materials, um, ex you, you, get an you have an opportunity to experience them differently. Um, so I just want to also say it's not archival that stands on its own, right? It's not, it's not just putting it up there, it's actually building a, um, it, creating a way of reading it and building a context around it that allows people to get something new um, or to engage differently. Mm -hmm. Um, so going back to the Emmett Till, um, you mentioned that the archival footage wasn't neutral. Mm -hmm. um, so would you say that you'd have to um, use footage in a way to subvert that message? I think you have to be conscious of the, the, the politics and point of view of any, any material that you're using. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about yeah. our process in, 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 in using footage in Detroit 48202. Um, so I mean, sometimes you may explicitly, I, I, I did a film with um, students back in 1990 that compared the, the um, media coverage of the Central Park um, Five and the Yusef Hawkins um, um, case, and so the students were. We were very um, explicitly in the film. The whole point was to deconstruct those archival materials. Uh, in other ways, I think that makers, filmmakers, you need to be conscious of that. It's not just a. It's not just an image, or it's not just a newspaper headline, but but it, it carries with it. Um, um, ideas and, and values. Yeah, yeah that's adorable because that's fascinating. Uh, Isn't and, it? And, and I was wondering, uh, was there actual was there actually a film crew? Did the cigar company actually film some of this stuff? Or is this some of this uh, uh, from personal? Uh, oh, I was in there with a cameraman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the old oh. photo. Mm -hmm. And some of the older footage that we saw was that just archival set to, to set the, the. I don't think there's any archival footage. There's a lot of photographs because okay. the historical background. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that 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 that, that, could that was all my research, all wow. my research, and and also the the research that I found in, in Cuba. And one more question, only because um, I have been filming in, in other countries. Mm. So, in in doing that, where did you did you have to go to Cuba to get this footage, uh, or we some have to find? Some of it was in Tampa. I mean, and it has to, it, it, you're guided by the, the knowledge of your story and the personal connections that you make. So um, some, of it, uh, some of it was in Tampa. I did uh, research in, in Tampa, which was the center of the cigar industry here as Cuban emigres came in the, with the 1870s, 60s, 70s, 1890s. Uh, and then I did um, research in, the archive in Cuba, and then that involved uh, not just the kind of the permissions that you need to be con consider when you're working in, in the U.S., but then it was even just having the right letter of introduction to get into that archive, and so, you know, following the, the 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 ways that other other societies uh, organize their their workflow. Yeah, that was my next question. Yeah. Like in, 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 in Cuba, because uh, Guinea. In Equatorial Guinea, where I've been uh, um, shooting, they have 
interesting governments and, um, <laughs> and can be very interesting what the, if they do give you access at all, mm -hmm. you know, then there's like, there, there's a lot of concern of how are you gonna show it and is it gonna be bad reflection? Mm -hmm. and, and so these are some of the things that I'm. Right, yeah, I think, I think personal relations are really important in this. Um, I mean, it's like, it's yes, how, what's the, what are the copyright rules? What, how do you get into an archive? But um, my experience has been that that, that personal relations are, are, are just as important as um, kind of knowing the keywords mm -hmm. to, to search. So in, in the case of Cuba, I really had the, the person's voice you hear reading the opening um, kind of voiceover is a, uh, someone I know for a long time, an old friend. And luckily his wife had been doing a lot of research about how um, Cuban seed Tobacco seed has traveled around the world, and and so it was through them that I was able to get to the director of the tobacco museum, and then that's part of the whole cigar industry. It's all related, and so that really granted me access to to that, and and um, so then some of that archival material came from the museum that the Zoe, the last woman who speaks in, in the trailer. So, and then the same with in in in. Um, the Detroit piece, personal relations lead to access in a way, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, Anne. Um, I just want to say um, I was really struck by first the Wu-Tang and then we're in a reflection for, for all of them as far as you know, just us as media makers that, um, you know, so much of that content as far as the archival, we're, we're just, you know, people, documenting what was going on in their lives, you know, and then, you know, 10 years later, then we realize, oh, this is, that moment we experienced was really important. Mm -hmm. um, and that just makes me recall um, the late filmmaker, uh, St. Claire, Claire Bourne, mm -hmm. would always say, you know, you've got to, you know, document your community, document your experience, and that material becomes content, that becomes valuable. Mm -hmm. And I always appreciated it sort of, you know, intellectually, but it's only recently that I really realized that like when I, when I saw your Wu-Tang film, Amilka, that, you know, yes, you know, what we just documented, you know, at a concert, you know, suddenly, you know, or, you know, in some time becomes mm -hmm. something that's really relevant, not just to our lives, but to mm -hmm. a larger audience mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of that footage was, um, sure, like early camcorder footage, um, you know, or just any kind of, there are a lot of folks with handheld cameras. Um, had who were motivated themselves to kind of invest in that early equipment, or um, more recent material, which is you know YouTube, uh, um, iPhone footage, posted on YouTube, and then you know there's some cautionary notes around getting material from YouTube, but then on the other hand, it can be a tremendous resource because people are putting so much up there. Um, so mm -hmm. it's it's true. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, one more coming back there. work from like the WPA and, and even before when she was going down to uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. And I know the Library of Congress supposedly has um, a process that you have to go through to get it from them. Mm. But there are little snippets on the internet. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, like for somebody like Darn Neil Hurston, where there's lots of, you know, there's a lot about, there's a lot of resources, but still they're not always that easy to get. I mean, like the early anthropological work she was doing, you know, in terms of going to other countries, I mean, the film footage of that. Mm. Any thoughts on that? I don't know um, about the specifics of that material um, and where it is or how, how, you know, how easy it is to access. I will say that oftentimes we end up working with local researchers um, and that'll be overseas, I mean, that'll be internationally, or it'll be at the Library of Congress, um, or even National Archives, um, and oftentimes it helps because they know that collection, and they're independent researchers, they're not on staff at the Library of Congress, I mean, it does require hiring them, um, and I don't think that's the only way to go, but I will say that there, that is an, a resource, and what they will do is um, 
oftentimes cut down on the time because they know where to go because that's what they're doing full time. They take clients and they go in and they search. They have the, they have the personal relationships um, with staff um, to try to gain access to mm -hmm. difficult collections. So, um, for the WPA, the Library of Congress is a really good resource and the good thing about the WPA is it was a government um, agency so those materials are public domain and for the piece on Detroit I used a lot of um, for one sec uh, um, no it's not in the section but there's a, 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 a section of the film that deals with the uh, struggle around the Sojourner Truth housing project in the 1940s and they're just beautiful beautiful black and white photographs that these like major photographers that um, but they were in the WPA uh, documenting and, and all of those were, were, were public domain so digging into the Library of Congress website uh, if you haven't already definitely that would be a place and then local local archives historical societies that are in in that area are, are places to go as well and we're going to give a, a, a list of, of ideas mm -hmm. we have a handout here to, it's not it's not comprehensive obviously but it, it it includes the kinds of places that you can start and get your 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 juices going and then you think of other places that might have you want to talk a sec about um, the next slide, the primary versus secondary sources and kind of Sure. Okay, so um, the, the next slide. we talked about why use um, archival material and it's, uh, it has its own power to bring to life the, the stories that, that were either uh, academics and scholars are talking about or that the people, witnesses in a particular historical period are telling you about. So we're, we consider the archival materials as a, a primary source, not just a supplement to the, the, uh, the primary, uh, uh, the, the people in the film. So it's primary, it's, it's evidence, it's artifacts that document the, that originates from those who had direct contact with an event or a situation. Um, so it could be, you know, a diary, a letter, an immigration record, a slave schedule, a passport. Um, all of these are primary documents. I had an interesting, I was speaking with a group of students today from a school in Toronto who were doing a whole project on activist, kind of activist archival work. And one young man asked if I considered people an archive. Mm -hmm. and and I said yes, because I mean, these things are, um, you can touch them. Even if they're digital, I mean, you can, you can kind of touch them, you see them. Um, but they're records of experiences that people have had. And so I am interested in expanding the notion of what an archive is. And I think that people in our families and in our communities are our archives and if you think of the oral tradition of many societies or people who who are are not literate for reasons of poverty or whatever um, but that there's rich there's rich knowledge in all of those people so I consider the the voices of, of people to also be an, an archive mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make one quick point about using archival and use, or using primary sources in general, and I, it was interesting that you're somebody who's interested in that very specifically. Um, one of the things I think it does is it, in presenting sort of evidence, this kind of first-hand evidence, it, it really asks viewers to take on some of the work on their own. Do you know what I mean? So it's not spoon-feeding, it's actually presenting and asking you to engage, to analyze, um, and to kind of critique on your own. So I think it actually makes a more active um, viewer and brings people into a film um, in, in this sort of unique and rich way. Um, and so I think that's some, some of the intrinsic power of it. And certainly, um, the eyewitness testimony is similar, does that similar kind of, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. does a similar impact. Yeah. yeah. Um, Should we next? Hmm? Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. 
So just in terms of how to, you know, and this is not, um, I mean, there are like an infinite numbers, uh, number of ways, and some of this gets into sort of editing technique, and, um, but there's, there's all different kinds of ways to think about um, employing archival material. And again, up here, I say an editor, director, archival, truly can collaborate and use narrative technique to make a story more compelling. Um, so there's the use of recreations, and we saw that in that Emmett Till clip, for example, um, and in, in, the, in the larger film, um, the experience of um, really, really asking a, a 2003 audience who watched that film to um, witness something in the way that the, that, that the nation witnessed it in 1955 when they saw the photograph of Emmett Till in Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, so recreation, giving people this kind of firsthand experience. Um, there is, um, you can also think of archival as not being literal um, and you can use it really in very poetic ways um, or kind of artistically. Um, in a, another project called The Great Invisible, which I mentioned, um, it was about the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And there were all, there's all this aerial footage of the ocean um, with these kind of streaks of red, what was oil, what was the leak. Um, and it created all of these kind of fantastic patterns. And the filmmaker really, she was, that was Margaret Brown, um, was really interested, she almost kind of created these abstract shots and, and um, used it as a motif throughout the film. And it, as it built, it, every time you would see this, um, I mean, because obviously she could have shown imagery of oil-covered birds, kind of the more kind of um, typical imagery of an oil spill or of kind of environmental devastation, what the consequences are of, of, were of that spill. Um, but using these abstract shots of the aerial footage um, sort of built this visual motif and it was quite poetic, it was terribly haunting, and it also you know, allowed for this kind of emotionality that I think was a little bit different, um, and that was using this archival footage um, kind of repeatedly as a motif. So it doesn't always have to be kind of a literal voiceover, or what it is is what it is. Mm -hmm. It can be kind of expanded, and you can broaden and kind of play with mm -hmm. this imagery. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that it can either be evidence to support an argument or you're mm -hmm. using that as evidence to show a counterpoint to something that is being said in, in, in the film or suggesting alternate ways to, to view something so there can be contrast. Um, and so definitely the continuity with, with, with the past and, and the present is there. Um, I think Archival can be used to uncover something new and tell a story in a new way so that you may want to, someone, you mentioned we've seen certain imagery many times, but there are different people who come to these histories and want to tell stories about them. So it's like the challenge to find new, new material, um, looking for shots that shots and different kinds of material that, that haven't been used before to tell the same kind, to, to, to tell, to give another take on, on a particular historical period or a story. Um, right, so I think the idea of creating drama and, and building scenes and moving that story, that's how I looked at a lot of the archival material I used in the piece on the cigar workers, because as I, as I was saying, it, to me, the, 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 the images had a, a look that I felt like I could, I could taste and, and smell Cuba of a, t of a particular time period. I could smell the, not only the cigars, but I could smell the, the books, the, the pages of the books that they were reading. And, and so it was that very sepia tone. So even starting with this, um, the stereograph, what is that called? The stereoscope where, the one of the archival pieces I found was that, that like duplicate image, and then when you look through the stereoscope, it, it, looks, it looks 3D. So that was just from that moment, kind of um, just engaging in like, who are these people? You know, who are these people sitting at these tables next to each other? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, right, so that, yeah, so let's move forward. 
Mm. Yeah. Can we talk about it? Ah, okay, right. So we're gonna we're gonna do a little case study of looking at some of our considerations in, in one section of the Detroit Fluorite 202 film, which um, is a section around the 1967 um, uprising in, in Detroit. So um, I'd like to ask you all a question. Whoops. So if you were hired to uh, find archival images for a film that was about the, um, I'll call them urban disturbances in, in many cities uh, with large black communities in the 1960s, what kind of images would you think to, to use or go after to? News media archives? <coughs> and what particular image from a news media archive oh, would you? Stuff we've seen in you know, the dogs having civil rights, the marches, the beatings, the KKK, all that stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. But I'm not talking about the civil, the, the southern civil rights movement. I'm talking about in, in, in urban, not just mm -hmm. northern, but let's just say northern urban areas where there were what we're just going to call civil disturbances in the like 67, 65, 67. National Guard. The student movement that were happening on the campuses, like UC Berkeley, San Francisco State. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bus strikes. Bus strikes. Okay. Who was the president there? Uh, um, Johnson. So anything they would say or could say that could create a contrast? Okay. Is that wrong? No, there's no right or wrong. Um, but your your film is you're 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 telling a story about cities that were in flame, up in flames. Let me put it that way, a little bit more specific. Fires, fires, burned out buildings. Uh, people throwing Molotov cocktails. Molotov cocktails. Mm -hmm. Arrests. Police. Tanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Afro, black power, the sheik is, all of those symbols of that time. Mm -hmm. And why would you show that? Could you say that again? I don't know if everyone heard. Mm -hmm. No, I said Afros, the sheik is, black power, you know, black panthers, all of that was yes. that period. Mm -hmm. Why would you search for images of, of the sheikis and black power symbols? Oh, it's in my head from something else. Because um, <laughs> that was the moment when all of that erupted in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, 19th, the late 60s. And why would you choose a Molotov, someone throwing a Molotov cocktail? Uh, well, that's how fires got started. <laughs> <laughs> Very technical. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, so if, you, if your um, archival producer found a bunch of images of people wearing dashikis and afros, and then they got a bunch of images of, of um, people throwing Molotov cocktails, what kind of decision would you make about how much to use of, of which of those? Mm. To put it next, right next to each other might not be the best choice. Right. <laughs> Why not? Well, I mean, there may have been some Black Panthers using Molotov cocktails, but then you'd have to tell the whole story of how they were invaded and they'd be responded with Molotov cocktails, not to sh suggest that they were just violent. Because the dashiki that already has it, kind of the guy who did all those murders in Dallas, was it a few years ago? The guy who murdered the cops, mm -hmm. they, they, the news put him in a dashiki often. Wow. And the discussion that I had with a lot of my friends is that the media was doing that on purpose and that was creating this image that anyone who wears a dashiki is like so militant that they'll, they'll take you out. So I, I see what you're saying, you have to be careful mm -hmm. with it. I just see, especially when, well, I see them differently. I don't have the same back, I don't have the back end. Yeah. Yeah. people in the neighborhood, the masses, you know, anger. Usually men would do, do this. It wasn't, it wasn't the culturally oriented people that were throwing the Molotovs. The person, the person watching has a bias already, right. so you want to make sure not to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think we also have to show the poverty, mm -hmm. show what, you know, show, you know, homelessness, show people 
you know, the housing is all dilapidated and maybe people right. on, on, on unemployment lines and other things that, that, that fed into the reason that. So we want to show the other side, so not just that they. You have to show Martin Luther King, too. Yeah, we want to show them why. <laughs> Yeah, they're all they're all important questions, and these are the kinds of things that um, that um, that I had in mind in dealing with that particular section of the film. Um, and I wanted to flip a narrative, and in, in, so the the film Detroit Four Eight Two O Two looks at the basically the twentieth century history of of people of Detroit as a way to look at what happened. Why, why did this city fall into such decline? And, and how, how did the, the policies and the, the, the whole history of racial segregation and segregation in housing and work and then policy decisions that, that had to do with um, um, Placing priority on what the what was good for the auto manufacturers versus what was good for the people in the city, and how these like this this legacy of of um, of uh, discord and and division really laid the basis for uh, the disinvestment that happened to a, a city that became predominantly black, and then somehow the blaming that took place that suggests the people who have stayed in Detroit are, are the ones to blame for what has happened to, to the city. So I really wanted to, 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 to flip that narrative and look at the, the, um, the, the economic and political background to understand what happened and also kind of counter the quick answers that have been given so that mm -hmm. When I started the project about Detroit, um, there was a lot of there was a lot of media attention on abandoned buildings, vacant buildings, blight, um, um, abandoned factories, kind of high fashion shoots in abandoned factories, and not that much about the people. So I was interested in in, in the people, and there was a. Um, there was a, 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 a strain of thought that said, well, Detroit was this arsenal of democracy. All these people came up from the South, black and white immigrants, got great jobs in the, in the auto factories. The middle class, this is how the middle class was built. And then somehow in 1967, um, black people went wild and threw Molotov co cocktails. All the white people fled. You got the first Coleman Young, the first black mayor, all this corruption and everything fell apart. And so I really wanted to, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I took time in this film to, to counter the narrative. And, and so this particular section about the 1967 rebellion, and I, and I, I mm -hmm. didn't say that at first because I wanted to like, just like let people say what they, what they wanted to say, but um, I, I, I wanted to look at the archival material in a way that would be part of uh, deconstructing and changing the narrative about what happened so that, um, yeah, so we're going to look at that section. Uh, yes? Um, in doing that and grabbing your, your, your collecting your images, uh, unfortunately I didn't see your film. Did you write first or did you collect the images and then, and then and create the film to what you collected? Is there a narrative that you collected? Well, so the the um, the main character, who's the mail carrier, really uh, drove the helped drive the process of finding the stories, and, and this is kind of an interesting um, part about the relationships and 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 doing archival research and finding your story. Wendell, who's the the mail carrier. Um, had been on this postal route for 25 years and he knew the people really well but he's also like a really um, inquisitive he's like a worker intellectual and so he had already been interviewing the people along the route and had been collecting their history so that at the point I said to him can I follow you with my camera and he said sure he he knew who mm -hmm. who along his route held that 
that history. So that that's what guided me to looking for the WPA photographs of the Sojourner Truth project because the, the story drove, drove me there. So, and and um, the same with um, like each section of the film really, the, I, sometimes an image will, I think, drive the story more, but sometimes the, the story pushes you to find the images that, that, that then, then appear and it's like, oh wow. It's like when I did Cuban Roots, um, my husband was telling the story of when he was nine years, 10 years old and, and they were in Havana and the, and the Fidelistas came in because the, the revolution had triumphed and, and he's a kid looking in these tanks coming in with all the, they called them the, Los Barbudos. So they came into Havana and people started um, smashing uh, parking meters. And this was because the, all the parking meters were owned by US utility companies. So it was a, an expression of not being controlled by these, this imperialist power. And I said, wow, that's kind of crazy. So then when I was doing my archival research and looking at that footage, and then I see people, I see images of people actually doing it. It's like, wow, bing, this, this kind of light bulb goes off. It's kind of exciting. But um, yeah. Uh, one other key point. Uh, prior to the rebellions, the stores did not have gates, the metal gates. Mm -hmm. It was after after the riots that they started putting the uh, what do you call those gates? Metal yeah. gates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know the the, the, the gates mm -hmm. over the, the, the stores. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, over the stores. Yeah, you know. Prior yeah. to that, the, the, you know, it was all glass and showroom. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because I can remember being in Detroit around 1969 and seeing two different types of black communities. One where she lived in this beautiful house and another one was in the hood. But when they had to go to the store, when they had to shop, they had to go out of their community and shop along the margins. And I'm coming from California. It didn't exist like that. Mm -hmm. And that was very strange to me. It had all the, the fences. Then you have to buy through these little doors. It's like, mm. what is this, mm -hmm. you know? But then, I mean, that was only one part of it. But then once I had to go to Detroit, and it was for a funeral. And that was completely different. I saw a whole different the youth culture there. It was actually a biker's funeral. Mm. And about 300 people showed up. And when we got to the parking lot where the, where the funeral parlor was, it was like, I know they're not going to where we're going. <laughs> and they were. <laughs> I mean, they were dressed to the nines, the, the all leather, and it was over like 200, almost 300 bikers. And this was like part of the youth culture. And they traveled, they had whole biking clubs in that part of the country, Detroit, Ohio, and all that. But they're all pretty much young people in their, in their early 20s. And we didn't have anything like that in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And they were, I guess some of them were living pretty good because their parents were working for the, the auto industry. Yeah. when it was on its last leg. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. The industrialization, it was right. like ebbing at that time. Mm -hmm. right. So by the time the uh, uh, early 70s had hit, it, it, was, right. it was a bust. Right, <laughs> right. Well, right. and it started in the 50s. And one other um, image that like, was exciting to find was the one where the, the smokestack is, is wow. uh, that had to do with the deindustrialization of Detroit. And so doing the research and the interviews, um, and, and I wanted very much to show that this process of deindustrialization and decentralization of the auto industry happens from the early 50s. So it wasn't 1967 that changed things. So, so, so um, how, do you, how do you prove that? Well, there's this black and white footage of this, um, this Highland Park um, Ford Sorry. factory and um, you actually see the smokestacks being knocked down and into, into rubble. So, um, so, but I just, I'm bringing up this and we're gonna look at this clip from, from, from the film to, to really just raise the question of um, that, that the archival material, it has to do with knowing the story, it has to do with knowing the history and the culture, cultural context of the story and the ethical questions of do certain images debunk or enforce stereotypes and how do you use them to do um, either one? 
And so that, yes, so then we'll watch this section. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Yeah. When I first saw this early this year when it was at BAM, oh, you were I was so happy to watch this documentary because everything I read about Detroit and all the different rebellions all over America, it's like people of color just wake up one day and they rebel. No. And like you said it, this was from the 50s. Things happening to our people and they just get tired of it. Mm -hmm. They just get tired of it. So mm -hmm. I'm. I congratulate you. But I want to ask you a question. The documents you showed at first with all of the brutality, was it hard to get that and where did you get that from? That's from the, um, the papers of the NAACP that are housed at the Walter Ruther archives. And so it was a matter of um, getting, getting the permission and I can't remember what we paid. I mean, we, we negotiated a, 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 and one thing I did, um, and this is kind of jumping ahead, but we negotiated a, a substantial discount from the Walter Ruther archives for material that, that I used in the film because I donated mm. all of my um, interviews, mm -hmm. the whole, like, whatever, 80 hours of interviews of these, the full interviews to be housed in their collection. Um, and so that, that relationship with the archives, it was a, a back, back and forth so that these stories can, can live. And you see it has to be a black archive to really tell the story. Well, it's not a black mm -hmm. archive. It's I mean, a, a black newspapers. Oh, 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 yes. Exactly, because um, like, well, like, 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 like um, what happened with the Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. We were all living in New York at the time, and, and at the community, we knew it as the Central Park 7, 8, and whoever we were talking to, Park, it could be whoever was arrested that day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even to this day, they're still leaving out two of the main attorneys when they're rehashing the story, uh, Colin Moore and Ultimatix. Mm -hmm. and, also, and they're still uh, bashing them without saying the role that they played in that. Mm -hmm. And also, a friend of mine's mother was portrayed in that Netflix film. Uh, uh, Numsa, Numsa Brath, yeah. and yeah. I was having trouble mm -hmm. finding anything in written media in terms of what the African American community was doing, because right. I know the community was doing something, but all the mainstream media said that they were doing nothing. So then we tried to get some information from the city sun, and so I, I uh, emailed Utrecht Lee, they don't know what happened to those files, mm. so to really know what happened. And then um, the media, if they said anything about numps of breath, they would say they couldn't shake her during mm -hmm. the testimony. Well, what was she saying? Mm -hmm. The fact is still not there what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show, you know, that's why it's important that we create our own source material. Right. Because mainstream media, you know and I know, reality, just, just because something is recorded, that's not the total reality. We think any, everything that's in print is reality. Mm -hmm. You can go to an event, a rally, and then you look at the news or the newspaper the next day, and it's, were we at the same place? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. going to be what's going to be documented in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, now we have alternatives. We got alternative media. Mm -hmm. so right. Thank God. And that's why it's yeah, so important, important to find an alternative. Community right. archival material. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, so the, 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 oh, so the, just on those NAACP, those were actually reports and there were folders, diff, like, like a whole, you know, lots and lots of folders and, and I went through them and chose ones that were kind of lent themselves more to use in a film, um, the stories that they, they were, that they were telling. Um, and then they were recreated by a graphic artist so that we could pull out certain key words and they were redacted that one of the agreements with the archive or with the, the restriction of the NAACP was to take out the people's names of, of who had done those reports. So, but I just want, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll look to take your responses, but then I, I wanted to point out specific images that I chose and the timing in, in to, to kind of explore this, this, this point. When you're um, pointing out those archival events, how, do you val how did you validate that? Suppose you was um, subjected to a certain type of propaganda when you're looking for archives that's only through the lens of one type of person. Like, how was you able to say, okay, this is the footage that makes sense that I want to tell the story about? Well, if the, um, the, 
the variety of sources in there, or the the soldiers are that's army footage. So that's from I mean I'm using it, but it was actually filmed by people in the the National Guard or the I guess the army because then that's in the National Archives. Um, papers of the NAACP, the um, uh, the news, the regular Detroit local news, and um, um, so I think there's a variety of, of sources that if I had to make the argument, I, I, w I would say it, it's not like I just went to a black revolutionary newspaper and, and used those, those images. I mean, this, it's the, the, the material is there. I made certain decisions to use it in a way um, to make certain points about that historical period. Um, so, I, I, but I think that, that issue of are you doing propaganda comes up whether it's you know, archival or who you choose to, who you choose to talk to. You know, it's dealing with a time period that we've seen images of, of many times, but how do you do it in a different way? And that was exactly what, so there were certain decisions I made. Um, one is the, uh, well, the, the placing of the, and this is, I think, the, this, this shot I love. And when I found it, I was so, so happy and I felt it was so, so important. And in fact, I, I really um, had a, I, I pushed the editor to, to make, it, it has to be included because this is like your dashiki. Um, shot. It's, it's like it's, it's saying that this time period people had political analysis of what was going on in the community. So it was stop the racist war in Vietnam. And there was a consciousness of people against racism support black power. So it was, it, you know, it wasn't just, oh, this, I'm angry, I'm going to throw a, a brick. It, it's, it, there was a, there were, there well, were. This, yeah, Right. So I wanted to, you know, I wanted that in there that there was a political consciousness in that community. It wasn't just like random violence. Um, so another piece about soul the, 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 that the, wasn't indiscriminate violence, right? Right. The mm -hmm. the, the placing of those um, the the soul brother and soul sister. Um, but the I I wanted to show when you look at the the scene of, of people dancing in that in that and in the club and and I think Anne when we were working on some of the proposals actually I kind of reflected back to me what was what was was what was going on there and it's that people just trying to um, enjoy themselves in their own space and in this city with this racist police force you can't even do that like you can't even be in your club dancing and and not be raided by the police so it's it's like if you don't show that, then, then you, you rely on, on it. oh, it's just somehow this community is violent. Then the other very specific, um, the, the bullets. I chose shots where you can see bullets going in that direction. If you, it goes by quickly. But what does that say with the footage where it means that those bullets are not coming down from snipers, Sniper. they're coming from the, the troops, they're coming from law enforcement. Right. And when you see the bullet holes on the buildings, that's what that's saying. And those are not the kind of images that you usually see when, I mean, I've never seen those images before in, in things about um, the, the rebellions of, of the 60s. So then also the, 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 the amount of arrests seeing people being brought in, in like, you know, what do you call them? Shackles? Shackles, oh, but like, like, you know, tied together oh, kind of. So that, yes, I don't deny, and I guess this is where the idea of um, propaganda, yes, people, some people burn those buildings, some of it, who knows who did it, but yes, there was destruction of that community. It's not like, it's not like I'm saying it it, it, it it didn't happen, but there's a context for it all. And then there was, um, if you notice the image of the, the bloody men on the stretchers, um, that's, that was news footage mm -hmm. from the news, news um, 
um, station. So it's a question of how much to use that, how much. Or I, I wanted to make the point, and I mean, I, the people speaking make the point that the killing happened mainly by law enforcement, killing people in the community. So that, that um, so when, when General Baker talks about that the killing, hap more of the killing happened on the west side of the city where the National Guard was versus on the east side of the city where the army was. And that's like, that's a whole other story of a lot of the army had come from Vietnam. They were m m more, um, Traumatized it could be aggressive. that that, and the National Guard were from like more rural areas of Michigan, and so mm -hmm. it was the whole like other kind of story going on there. But I wanted to show that people were killed, but I didn't want to show I didn't want to dwell more than necessary on seeing like bloody black bodies, and so the, the film like. Um, um, Detroit, it was called Detroit. The one mm. about the Algiers Motel incident. I've heard about that. I felt um, spent 20 minutes just showing the, the brutalization of these black men by the police. So on the one hand, if you don't know anything about that history, that can be important to see um, that it happened. But after a while, it's like, how much does it become um, sensationalizing or, um, what's the word? Shock value. Shock value, and it's okay, we get, we get the point. So I, I, I was conscious of, these were the kinds of decisions I was making in this section of how and when and what images to use. So yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Yes? Um, yeah, I noticed um, that the, Footage and the interview, uh, interview the subject uh, weave together pretty um, transition or uh, seamlessly. Where he you showed foot or he spoke about working in the factories and you showed footage of that, and then he immediately talked about afterwards, like they would go to the nightclubs, and mm -hmm. then you showed footage of that, and then immediately after, like they were, like they talked about the police raids. And I was wondering if that was, um, were the, did you already have footage of that, or did um, it was, or did the uh, subject talk about it, and then you had to find footage for it? Well, I knew that that story, so I knew I knew I would want need footage of it, um, and that's it's just it's this this. The story of what happened in 1967 is like it's you know it's well known. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, it was difficult to find. Um, it, it was lucky that we were able to find that, good, and, and a little bit of it is is coaxed by the the way it was edited, so that with that that um, what do you call it that flashlight that points up um, was was used in a way to, to emphasize that. Um, did you have to use any leading questions to get the story, or did that just naturally flow? No, um, and people people remember very well what happened. And General Baker, the, the man who has the T-shirt that says "Black Men," and he's he's a legend of Detroit um, activist history. So if you, there was no no leading. I mean, he's like <laughs> he's 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 got a, a a story to tell and. And just people, people remember, you know, like, like Kim remembers um, how her choice says her grandmother pulled her in off the porch because, you know, people remember tanks going up and down the streets. Yes? Yeah, so that just, jo just um, made me think of two related questions about the privacy, but also jogging people's memory about these traumatic events mm -hmm. and so sort of your ethical considerations around that and practically how you did it. So I know probably there are questions like that in all the films you made, right? So um, mm -hmm. I was just curious about the approach, like you had these figures in the community who were leading you to other figures, but um, you know, to what extent did you like prepare people who had been through these events that you knew you wanted to talk to or go through another person? And then when they share the story, 
you know, how are your choices in terms of like their privacy? Mm-hmm. You know, the guy in the, you know, in the stretcher, obviously that's public footage that mm-hmm. you chose to, you know, use a certain portion of, but mm-hmm. if it was something you came across in terms of a story, like how did you approach those considerations? Um, I, I think with sensitivity and, and respect, um, I, I think decide, with that particular footage to use just enough, I think was doing that rather than kind of exploiting that, that footage. Um, in terms of people's stories, in this particular film, no one, um, no one had to be kind of led on or, or coaxed. Um, in the film I did, Cuban Roots Bronx Stories, um, I mean, just in terms of one thing I'm sorry about in, in the Detroit film is when it had to be cut down, one individual um, story was kind of truncated and, and looking back I feel uh, it bothers me and that's the um, um, the part was a, a, a white working class woman who has lived on Wendell's route for the whole time he's been there a totally committed activist um, she even goes to the National Action Network <laughs> meetings in Detroit but she's just um, it, it was a very important and, it, and somehow in all the decisions you have to make when you're cutting, I think her story got, got limited so you don't get the full sense of her activism. But um, the thing about, in, in Cuban Roots Bronx stories, which was a personal family story, but my husband's family, not mine, so that the, the amount of pushing that I could do with certain people um, was, 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 I understood my position and I was respectful of the people in the family who didn't want their, you know, their, their, their business, their history to be aired. And it, I think it affected also the story because some important voices didn't get, um, didn't, weren't included. But I don't know, I, I have a consciousness of kind of respect for, for, people and their, their privacy or what they want to say. I don't know if that answered the question. But I think it's like, for me, it's like how you use material and songs or whatever, and how you use people, if you talk to people, it's the same kind of considerations. Is there another question? Yes. Yeah, well, you just brought it up, song, because, uh, I mean, the, the images are very powerful and amazing, but you picked the perfect track um, to go along with that. And um, I was wondering, what was that conscious decision? And I know in many cases, um, licensing the music can be very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons why I produced a film called American Beatbox, so that was my first delving into uh, documentaries. And the only reason why we were the very first movie to be nationally broadcast, because I did the whole soundtrack. Because mm-hmm. uh, Breath Control and, and, and The Fifth Element, uh, but they both screened at the Tribeca, they were amazing films, but they never made it because they didn't license the film, they didn't license right. the music. Which brings up a, an important point about, you know, when you're doing your research, you can find all kinds of things on, you know, on, on YouTube, or you'll start searching the Internet Archive, and you'll find um, great stuff. And, but it's important not to fall in love with the, the, the footage, because when it comes to, wow, how much does that cost? And, and the same with music. So. I, you know, as, as soon as I heard <laughs> Gregory Porter sing that song, and it's got to be in, it's got to be in the film, and um, um, that's one song that I did did fall in love with, and wasn't gonna not not use whatever it cost, but because of also connections with the musician who wrote whose other music I use, who's from Detroit, so Gregory Porter's not from Detroit, but his one of his professors from college. Um, is from Detroit and through speaking with him and then there was um, a negotiated, um, it was still expensive but it was less than it might have been. That, that was the most expensive piece of music and then um, 
the few seconds of the, the dancing um, was the most expensive, I think. Was yeah, that the yeah. most? Huh? Yeah, the few seconds of the dancing, so it's NBC footage, but then there was no other, you know, footage like that. Um, and so the song that I wanted to go with, the, where they're dancing in, in the Blind Pig, um, I, I said, well, what was the most popular song of the summer of 1967? And it was Jimmy Mac. So that's another, can't afford that. <laughs> so the, 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 the composer that we worked with um, wrote something that like sounded like it. So that's also what you, you know what you can do with, um, with sound. Mm -hmm. So um, shall we move on? Because yeah. I think Time they want, yeah, no, they want no. how can to I get this stuff. Questions? Oh yes. Um, when it comes to archival footage, if it's attached to news, are you limited to use what the news has said, or can you just use the footage for your own, it's whatever it is? Oh, you mean can you separate the right. track? Yeah. So you mm -hmm. can separate the, the image or the footage from the actual what's being read from the news or yes. whatever article you got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, would you consider news footage as fair use? It depends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get into fair use. It depends. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, you, you can't just use it because I need a shot of, of um, something happening and they, they got it. If, um, there are considerations if, if, if you're critiquing it for one, um, you need to be able to show it to critique it. So that's one, one way. Uh, and then there are other considerations of, um, Best effort, and we'll we'll, we'll get it, we'll get yeah. into that, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So the basics of research. It's definitely detective work, but it's it's logical and it's I love it. It's just it's, it's like you know it's like okay what what stone. What can you find under one stone that leads you to another stone to uncover? Um, so it's. Are we going to do this part, or are we combination? You want to do the first column, I'll do this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think what we've talked about is, is a combination of experience and know-how. So your experience working with archives in the past, or experience with the story, experience with the people, and your relationships with, um, relationships with archivists, relationships with your subjects, relationships with uh, historians, that can lead to um, good, good uh, solutions and good finds. Definitely being um, tenacious and patient, and um, you know, finding finding different ways to describe your what you're looking for when you're you know in the uh, on, on these different websites. Talking to a lot of people is good. Uh, visual research is not to be underestimated. It's very time consuming, but hugely rewarding and enriching to your story. Um, so I'll run down this next list. Um, this certainly, so the research can inform your story by telling you what's available. Um, I'm not really sure what I meant by that. Anyway, um, it certainly can impact your shooting. Um, so oh, yeah. you know what's available, or you know what you actually have to shoot. What, you know, and there's this kind of back and forth relationship between the production, your production team, and the research team, trying to figure out how are you going to kind of get this story um, told completely. And so oftentimes you'll know that you can, uh, for example, in that Emmett Till um, trailer, you know, there was the, the present day shot of the landscape of the river that kind of dissolves into um, the archival piece. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a way that the, your, your present day shooting is going to um, be informed by um, the archival that you find. Um, also, research can lead you to witnesses, very obviously. I think we've kind of covered that a little bit. Um, in Emmett Till, we did actually find someone through the archival material 
um, a name is mentioned, and then you can do some digging and some research. You might find somebody who is a witness who can then participate. Um, this documentary, 63 Boycott, was al is also this really kind of great example of it. And JT, I don't know if that hyperlink works, um, but it's pretty cool what they did. Um, this is Kartemquin, um, and you see there's this little tab there. It says, help identify participants. Um, not, press, not that, but up, uh, uh, come down right here. Help identify participants. And there are a series of photographs. Um, and it's asking people in the community. This is about um, the, the boycott in the school boycotts in Chicago. They got a hold of this tremendous body of photographs, and they're asking. They're basically putting up here. Um, can you help us identify people who participated? And so this woman here, Lillian Gregory, and um, James. Yeah, James Foreman. So obviously there's some really well-known members, uh, you know, participants in the civil rights movement, but then other just individuals who were like young people and students. Um, and it, it, it's a very cool, actually, does that link work? How about choose a location, south side location maybe? Anyway, you can click through there, and then you'll see that the individuals have little tags put on them as people are sorting through, and they're like, oh, okay, I could tell you who um, some of these individuals are. Um, anyway, so archival can actually lead you to the people who will participate in your film. And then the last little point about it is that really starting early is very important. Um, during kind of the research and development stage, uh, you know, phase, um, you're going to start to gather this material. You know, one important thing to think about, especially in historical documentary um, storytelling, is is it a f is it, there are many many good stories. Is it a story that actually lends itself to film and documentary? There needs to be enough visual material. And I worked once on a project about this really really um, critical groundbreaking legislative change um, in the desegregation of hospitals. Um, and in this early phase of research, we really discovered that a lot of that change happened kind of behind closed doors. It was governmental change. It was through legislation. It, was a, it wasn't a real visual quality to it. So while we were able to find images of hospitals and of segregated hospitals, we couldn't actually kind of like, you know, there, there was not a whole lot of news material, for example. There weren't any specific events that would call people to document it. So, there are some stories that actually don't lend themselves that are, are probably stronger books um, about the past. And so you just want to think about what kind of visual material is available um, as you kind of embark on this. And, and starting early is really important. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Right. So one first thing to do is create a, a research list kind of a wish list, and, and then identify your resources. It's in, and by resources, it's all the kinds of things we've been mentioning, whether it's you know, libraries, like who, who might be a repository of uh, things, re <coughs> things related to this story. And then tracking your research, organizing and log all the material you bring in. And, and we'll show you some images of, of, of um, systems to do that. And so you want to maintain your research standards and check for accuracy and so that you have this, uh, you can go back to it if someone says, well, is this true? Where do you get it from? You, you want to be you know, accurate and, and so not just say, oh, I see something, I, you know, I Googled an image, let me grab it and, and, and put it in there. You, you really have to, to verify. So here, for example, is the, the wish list, part of the wish list, <laughs> I gave Amilka. Um, and this was already, um, I was way, way into the story. So I really, I wasn't starting from the beginning with, with this list, so that I knew some specific things. So, uh, and then I indicated for her the, the priority of things. So. For example, in, in Act One of the film, 
footage, photos of the demolition of Paradise Valley in the late 50s. Which Paradise Valley was the um, main black community in, in Detroit that was urban renewaled away. <laughs> so I wanted the construction of that freeway that, that did that. Uh, so these are, you know, I wanted um, headlines and the letter. So at, at this point, I was already pretty specific, specific, if you know. Well, this part of the film has to do with um, the migration of uh, the Great Migration, how folks got to Detroit. So uh, I was looking for a specific letter to the Chicago Defender uh, that was in April, I knew it was April 24th, 1917. So I had read about it in some of the research. I wanted the visual of that letter. Uh, so I was able to, to be very you know, specific in that regard. And then look for migration photos or footage that hasn't yet been overused, like trains. So often, you know, okay, people came from the south on trains, which is beautiful. I love those shots. Mm -hmm. But it's like, <laughs> they are, it's already been done. So what's another way, way to do that? So yeah, to create a list like this if it's um, and I wish that it's going to be always an evolving list. There's going to be many, many, many drafts of it. There's a lot of back and forth between what kind of what what is really just a wish, um, and will not. Be, you know, the, there was a this document, a, a film called Koch about Ed Koch, um, and the director was just insistent on having this um, in the 1977 mayoral campaign in New York, um, it was a pretty, it was a bunch of really well-known uh, public figures who were trying to become mayor and, and, and Ed Koch emerges in this. Um, and there was this, um, I guess his main contender was Mario Cuomo, his, uh, his rival for this, this seat. And there were, in interviews, um, we were told that all throughout the subways, there were posters that were put up that said, <laughs> vote for Cuomo, not the homo. There was a smear campaign against Mayor Koch during that campaign. Um, and it was something that um, I don't think he ever forgave Mario Cuomo for. And that was over years and years and years of a relationship, um, a, a political relationship. They're knowing each other. Um, that was something that the director wanted to see. And it was something we just could not find. So sometimes a wish list just stays a wish list, and sometimes it just has to be in the voice of the, the first person, you know, the, the interviewing. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of um, resources, we'll hand this out to you so you can walk away with it, but you think about them in these kind of big categories. And again, this is not comprehensive, but um, you've got personal and family collections. Um, and add to this kind of home movies and this is not, th there are people who are now um, collecting around home movie footage. Um, there's something called Home Movie Day. Um, and I know it travels from city to city. Um, so it's, it's just something to think about. Um, you'd want to find out when, if, you know, if, if, for example, if you're looking for particular home movie footage um, in Detroit or in San Francisco, um, LA, I know had one. Um, you find out who the, um, the, the kind of the host institution and they can kind of help you kind of navigate who has these materials. But there have been, there's been a call, um, particularly around um, African American home movies, um, trying to get them um, preserved and kind of, you know, uh, archived. So you can think of home movie, home movie material um, informally individuals may have or kind of the way that people are starting to collect around it. Um, so then news and newspa news, newspapers and publications, um, commercial and stock image collections, museums, archives, public and university libraries, nonprofit organizations, historical um, societies. Um, these are all places that are going to have oftentimes visual material. Um, government archives and collections, corporate archives become important. Uh, always you want to think about international archives. And not just if you're doing, it, not only if you are telling a story about, a, um, about a, an, someone, a, a story that takes place outside of the United States, but you'd also want to think that international archives are sending news teams to the United States to cover the news 
um, for their constituent communities. So you'll have um, French press here covering the civil rights movement, or you'll have, you know, and so you want to actually make sure that you're looking, even if your, your topic is not um, international, you want to think about the international um, mm -hmm. archives. Um, you always want to think about filmmakers, other filmmakers who've made films about this subject, um, whether it was, whether in, in more recent times or going back, um, distributors are oftentimes a way to get to those filmmakers. Um, and filmmakers sometimes have their outtakes and are willing to let you make, you know, make use of it or access it. Um, and we, on here we've got Third World Newsreel, um, <laughs> Icarus. Um, and the, another very, very important uh, tip is to look at the end credits of films that are similar to the ones that you are making or cover in some, maybe cover a portion or the historical period that those end credits will have archives listed. Um, you can assume that the filmmaker who made a film about a subject with some overlap or very similar to, you know, to taking on the same topic, that they made choices and that you might make different choices, that they, they didn't use everything that was available, so that there are, there's more available, and that's one way of kind of teasing out um, some of the additional um, sources and material. Mm -hmm. And then finally, like community and local organizations Oftentimes there is just someone who just becomes the um, unofficial photographer or the unofficial collector for a tenants organization, a social club, an activist organization, an alumni group. Um, so thinking about all different ways that these materials are gathered. And so I think there's some examples up there as well. Um, but resources, kind of really brainstorming is important. For instance, when uh, Stanley Nelson made his Black Panther film, there was another filmmaker who had a whole lot of archive material that he had shot many years ago, and he actually just donated a lot of that material to him. Mm -hmm. um, on the other end, uh, in terms of international archives or international issues, um, we found in doing films about Korea that, in fact, much of the archives were in the U.S. archives, because then during the war, they just took everything out of the country and brought it here. And that, in fact, there is a whole lot of material of other countries that the U.S., whenever they went into places, they just took. And so, and not a lot of it um, hasn't been cataloged well. Hmm. So, like, a lot of the new revelations of what happened turned out there stuff that was in boxes in the archives that scholars went through and found, oh, there's all this stuff no one's ever talked about. So there's a lot of hidden stuff in the U.S. stuff that you can look at that may be in public domain. Mm -hmm. Right. Next. Next slide. Oh, this is, um, and this is another handout, so don't worry too much about this, but this is just a list of some really great starting points, um, good resources. Um, the New York Public Library, um, there is uh, their digital collection. Um, they actually have a, a, uh, a website, super, very cool kind of visualization, actually, of all of the material in their collection that's in the public domain. Um, a, a cool way to look at imagery. Library of Congress, National Archives. Um, Getty is a great place to browse. <laughs> Selectively, it's, it's, a, it's, an expensive, it's an expensive option. Um, but because Getty has acquired so many smaller collections, they do, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's at least important to see what they have. Um, YouTube go crazy, and then <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great entry point. It's a great place for discovery, um, but there are many, many caveats because tracking back to who the actual copyright holder is can be very difficult when people are just posting and reposting and liking and reposting, and so it's very hard to um, actually um, kind of follow the breadcrumbs all the way back to, um, and, and actually kind of figure that out. And even just the communication, how do you actually reach out to people on YouTube? It's actually become a little more difficult. Um, Internet Archive, or also known as archive.org, people refer to it as, is a tremendous resource. Footage.net, 
Another great resource is a way of kind of looking across um, news and commercial archives um, if you want to uh, kind of do a, a quick sweep. Um, New York City Municipal Archives, there's a d Department of Finance, the, the tax photos, so that's like every, every, it, it, every photo, every building in, um, in, in the five boroughs was photographed at two points in history. I, I think, I, I don't have that in my head, but um, you know, it's, it's a, you, can, you can look up and actually get visuals. This is actually as they're kind of assessing property tax. So I think it was done in the, was it in the, in the 40s, I believe? Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a later set. Um, and then there's actually newspapers.com or ProQuest, it depends. A lot of these are subscription-based, but they'll give you access to um, newspapers. Um, and places like, if you're really looking for um, a lot of public domain images, the Library of Congress and National Archives are really good to combine as, as much as you can. <laughs> uh, I did that, as well as some of the, the municipal archives. And add to this, just right down the Schomburg, it is part of the, the New York Public Library, but tremendous archives at, at the Schomburg as well. I have a question, but I, I bet it's a question everyone in here wants to know. Are we at that point where I can ask a very general question? Yeah. Cool. What does this cost? Um, what is your role, uh, what I refer to you as uh, archival producers, or just producers, I'd love for you to go through the Detroit film and give me, if I was going to hire you to do archival work, what would you say, more or less, this is the ballpark, this is what it costs. And then another question I want to throw in is... For the footage or for the person working on it? For the, the producer. person working on it, because the footage, I mean, that, that's a that cost. Right. That you, mm -hmm. We're not going to bill you personally for mm -hmm. that, right? You mm -hmm. would bill a company for that. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question I have is, when you said that the most expensive thing that you got out of the Detroit thing was the, the footage of people <laughs> dancing, why didn't well, you... per second. Per second. Yeah. Why, why didn't you just um, recreate that? That has cost. Oh, so you just kind of you weigh the two? Is this something I never thought about until I learned that a lot of documentaries are just recreating stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. putting yeah. it in there as, you know, you don't know it's not archival, but it looks right. archival. Yeah. Um, it's an aesthetic choice. It's a creative choice. Um, and it's not free. I mean, okay. it's not like, it's not like, you know, and, and there's also like the time of a shoot. Sure. Um, do you have the, the chops and the, you know, like the authenticity. to kind of create cool. something? Cool. Um, but it definitely is an option. Yeah. I mean, people cool. use recreation. People yeah. use animation. Yeah. It could have yeah. been animated, oh, yeah. oddly. Yeah. I mean, There's like, a film, um, um, Nyla and the Resistance, um, which is about a Palestinian woman. And she was in prison and actually had her baby in, in prison. And they didn't have, there was no footage of that, but the animation is just like super moving and beautiful and, and works really, really well. Uh, it's ex that's expensive, it's expensive though. But yeah, that's So back option. to my first question. Well, in <laughs> terms of the Detroit film, mm. I had done a lot of the research and found a lot of stuff before um, I had funding to hire um, Amilka. So I think that cut down on some of the cost of what and, mm -hmm. and even when Amilka, we, we were working together, so I think it, it helped. Um, well, you can't but, say, you can't but, put a number out, you can't tell, I have no idea, I don't know if it's like, you know, $20 an hour or $5,000 per movie, um, $20,000, I don't know. Mm -hmm. is that, is that Do you want to say what's your yeah. Anne has a good answer. Sure, yeah, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> deflect it a little bit um, from, from them. So it is, I mean, it is a, a tricky thing because you know, you're asking people's rates, you know, and that's something that's negotiable and, and private. But um, I can certainly say from my, my years of experience you, you, um, that you can, you know, pay somebody who's, you know, at a, a, a junior researcher who's maybe like at a PA level who makes like $100 a day. Or you can, re or you can, you know, hire somebody who's an expert, specialized researcher who might be $500 a day, right? And so it really depends on what you're, what you're looking for and how specific it is. So if you, know, so if you just need general someone to, to go through, do the research, you know, look through their list, you know, maybe a, a junior researcher can do it. But as you know, Emilka and P Pam said earlier, if it's 
you know, a lot of it is about experience. A lot of it is about knowing the collections, and especially when you're working with collections that are about people of color, that are about working people, that are about women's stories, a lot of those are very hard to find. So you really need somebody who, who knows the collections, who knows not only the collections, but also the history as well, so they know how to sort of navigate. So to answer your mm -hmm. questions, you can pay small day rate, large day rate, depending on what you need. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that helpful? It does. I, I guess I assume that there was kind of a standard, like if you're DP or whatever, your entry, there's an entry, I think, I guess that's what you're saying. There's an entry rate, and then if you want someone who's more hardcore, then you need to fork up What's the dough. What's the entry rate for a DP? Uh, well, it depends. Maybe, you know, <laughs> two, three hundred bucks if they, and, you know, and for someone more experienced with better cameras, and you're looking at, you know, I don't know, two, three, th four, five thousand, depending so, on it. You know. <laughs> Similar. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a mm. um, You mentioned, and I apologize for being a little late, I coming from a shoot. You mentioned um, some of the news archives, because we were doing a film recently and we were trying to get like local news coverage of different events in the city, and we tried to call like the different news stations for it, and we just got stonewalled. Mm. And, and so, is there like a, I guess, a one stop shop? And I saw a couple up there, because I saw CNN had some stuff. And you mentioned the NBC News Archive, so I have to look into that. But are there other, like, almost like one-stop shop places I can go get, like, a lot of footage? You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> not <laughs> not well, one-stop shop. Well, you're, ta you're talking about New York? Well, uh, yeah, New York, essentially, yeah. Uh, New York-based stuff, so. Um, there is, it isn't a one-stop shop situation. I mean, the only, the best, I mean, that, that footage that net searches across some, um, da databases yeah. that, and it includes um, some news archives um, but even there it's kind of uh, you, you actually do need to go to the um, and first of all there's a there's a distinction between the national and local news or the affiliate stations and so sometimes I mean it, it, it's a it is a complicated question because it also depends on the time period um, local news seems to be better preserved um, during the period of film than during the period of video. Um, I think video, so like we're talking like 80s into 90s, is, was considered more disposable. So there's a lot of news, local news stations were kind of tossing it. Um, whereas film, also probably because film has maybe, um, at least compared to early video, um, has kind of more, it's more robust as a format. Um, so it probably had, and, and there's also the value that we place on film versus video, that people think of film as um, a higher art, even if it was, I don't know. There's lots of reasons why um, you're gonna find some material in some time period and, and not in others. But local news, um, it seems to go that film is more available, not, but not necessarily, um, you know, not, not easy, um, that, that video period is going to be a little bit more challenging, and then as the kind of digital news, as, as this material is now kind of more data-based, um, there is good chances of finding material. Well, I mean, well, that's the thing, because, so basically you don't recommend potentially calling local news stations like Spectrum or, because we called the local NBC, ABC, and they were just like, no, they were like, okay, yeah. So. And I'm sure a lot of other people may have had and, this. And issue. now, I mean, now I don't, I don't know, Anna, if you've had this experience with ABC. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. There's there's a lot of change happening, um, sort of across. You know, I know that now that ABC News video source, which, which used to, you know, that's the, for the. Um, it was basically the archive for um, ABC, like the national, the network. Um, I actually think at this point they might be limiting their material to um, kind of Disney mm -hmm. projects to Disney because so there's there's a lot of changes that are happening. Um, if you again, if you can find, I'm thinking um, it, it is. I, I would say it's more fruitful to go case to go one by one um, and try to. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand what the stonewalling is. It's, you know, when you go to a local station also, they are in the business of making news, not necessarily archiving it. Maybe they've got a few, one, one staff person who might be dedicated to this. 
Um, but I can, I can maybe give you some specific suggestions, but it's, it is a challenge. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've found that um, for, um, for the local affiliates are, are not very helpful, but for the major news stories, they'll funnel it up to the, the networks. So if you're, so if it's, um, so for, yeah, so maybe the local NBC, CBS don't respond, but if they have an important story, then that oftentimes will go to the network archives. So, so definitely check that out. And then for old, what period is your story? Just in the past five years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there is, there's also news clipping services. Um, and these are, this is a, these are organizations like, um, what is it, uh, Metro Monitoring? Um, I can probably, I can give you a few names. So, so people who work in kind of like, I guess the PR world, th these are basically monitoring services that are, um, oh, actually I've got some other ideas. Um, these are monitoring services that are constantly, they're just basically digitizing material and they've got clients like Coca-Cola or an individual and they want to kind of understand what they're, what kind of, um, rep how they're being represented. So they, these, organi these mon news monitoring services are sometimes a, um, a resource. And then, the, you know, there's also, um, there are some open source news archives and and I would go to internet internet archive there's the TV news archive there and yeah. it's pretty tremendous yeah. they are internet archive. internet archive and you can actually search you can do um, actually uh, keyword searching like you can search um, transcripts so if you want to know if, if they're talking if some this and and th this um, news archive TV news archive is um, the major cable networks and the network news and then some local, very limited local. It's actually probably mostly Bay Area because I think that's where the recording is happening. Um, and that goes to, that's basically from 2009, 2008 or 2009 forward that they have been. And it doesn't mean that you have the right to, you, you can see it, you can search it, you can play with it. It doesn't mean that um, you can afford it or <laughs> that you can or that you can get the permission but at least you can see the news cov the news coverage and it's going to be um, mostly network news oh the mo news monitoring yes yeah, I think there's a few companies out there that do it, and, and many of them are familiar with like working with documentaries to try to find particular news stories. Um, yes. So um, for people who don't have the budget right now, like me, <laughs> um, could you guys, uh, both of you, give a little um, how did you start? Was it just, would you just say go to these sites that you have here? How did you start? Because I, Pam, I had a, that you got some of the archival footage before you mm -hmm. brought another yeah. one. I looked on these, mm -hmm. I, I went to these sites. I mean, anyone you know, could go and, and just, you know, and train. Free, and you just organize them and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna show you how we organize it. Um, what, to, um, they, I'll say that there's always, you can always somehow pull down a working copy. Um, it's probably going to be a low resolution mm -hmm. image mm -hmm. or a low resolution mm -hmm. um, media file. Mm -hmm. um, or you can invest in pretty inexpensive um, sort of capture software or kind of download software. But again, that ends up being your working copy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, first of all, it wouldn't stand up to kind of any sort of broadcast quality. Mm -hmm. it, it would kind of bring down the quality of your own work if you're using kind of this really rough material. Okay. You want to kind of get the the best copy you can. Um, so, so you may start off with but that. You but you can start with that. These are you your working materials. You can go materials. and buy, purchase a right. Right. better You can build your story uh, and then uh -huh. keeping in mind though, don't, don't fall in love with something that you know is very expensive, but you, okay. you can still um, oh, okay. do the creative work of mm -hmm. incorporating and interweaving your images with your other material. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a, a work sample then that 
can help you get funding so that you can get the oh, the, like um, the uh, right. high resolution and license the licensing of uh -huh. it. Yeah. Just another nuts and bolts point here is that that wish list that um, you generate. It might be something that you give to someone on your team, a junior researcher, an experienced researcher that you're doing yourself. You can also send that wish list to individual, to, to different archives. And many archives, whether it's the news archives or historical sites, will do a limited amount of free research, mm -hmm. or at least they'll tell you what, their res what the research fee is. Mm -hmm. There's a benefit to that. They know their collections super, super, in, like, like they should. Ideally, they know their collections better than um, I do. The converse to that is they are managing many, many different requests and responsibilities. So my basically doing your own research and having the support of somebody inside the organization doing research is actually probably the best mm -hmm. um, scenario. Have either one of you dealt with Al Jazeera? Because they have, I've been doing some research and they have a lot of footage that I'm looking for for mm -hmm. this particular West Africa piece, but yeah, I was wondering if you ever dealt with them. I have not. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So we should move on to the, do you think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So organizing the material. Oh, oh these are so, there's so many points to make. I'll do this really quickly. Okay, research um, tips. More research tips. Um, oh, just a quick note to avoid grabbing material haphazardly from, the, from YouTube. It's difficult, and I think I've made this point already. Um, you can fall in love with something and not ultimately be able to use it. But and, then, and also, um, y knowing where you, you may find something and then not know where you got it from later, because you'll start amassing all of these you know, images. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Identifying other films that have been made on the subject matter or on p portions of it, that's really, it's really important So, for, for so many reasons, um, but it's a great starting point. Um, and the other piece of it is, I, I think I described that the end credits can really um, open up uh, footage possibilities, but I think what, actually what you mentioned in donating your original footage, um, a film, so this film I worked on, on the Egyptian, Revolu the, the Egyptian Revolution, the Arab Spring, there was a front line, and actually front lines interviews, right, the actual um, interviews that they did, which was their original material, became archival material for us. You know what I mean? So knowing what's out there, I wouldn't be afraid that you'd be so closed with your vision of your film that you don't actually explore what else is out there that can be a resource. Um, I'll mention WorldCat and Archive Grid. Um, WorldCat basically, it has, basically it itemizes the collections of 72,000 libraries. Um, and I did a, in working on a film about Jane Jacobs, I uh, was able to see actually where she appeared um, as a subject in other people's films mm -hmm. because of the detailed, um, the detailed, um, entries in, in WorldCat. Um, so that was, that was a, that's a great mm -hmm. resource. I mentioned this already, sending your wish list to the archives and also doing your own work. And another distinction to make is that there's online research and there's on-site re research. Um, a lot of research now, more and more, can be done online but it might, it might be limited to what has been digitized and that you always wanna ask what is not available online that I can actually come to your physical, um, your physical site. site and actually search. Um, and that, that, at that point it might be actually that kind of what you imagine an archival <laughs> researcher doing like white gloves going through files, right, right, you right. know, that sort of situation. Like none of those NAACP um, folders were digitized, so it was going in and folder by folder looking and reading and selecting them. Okay, good. So next slide, types of research. Keep track your, track your research. Keep notes on who you contact and the status of research, what they had and what they didn't have, who your contacts are. Um, again, you're building that relationship and you don't want to go back and, and ask for something that you already asked for. Um, 
So negative research is research that you do that doesn't yield any results, but it still takes time and informs your process. So it's, yes. Um, if you're doing a film, let's just say on a, a, a park, right? A Yosemite National Park. And you find archival footage that looks like it was in Yosemite National Park, but it's not Yosemite National Park. What is your opinion on using that footage and throwing it in there without? Yeah, <laughs> what is your opinion on that? I think I, that's a creative choice. Again, I think it's a creative choice, and I think people do it. We actually were talking about this in terms of um, the rebellion footage. Um, there's a lot of imagery of um, Newark. And not make it, and not be kind of like sliding in some. Um, I guess there you can take certain creative liberties, but I think you have to be prepared to discuss them and to discuss what the choice that you make. I don't think it's. I think there is an ethical question about trying to kind of um, slip one by people. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just go, in my film, the dancing footage, those are not people dancing in, in The Blind Pig on 12th and Claremont, but it's of that time period. You know, I don't, they weren't in necessarily in Detroit, and it might have been 68 not, or 65, I don't know. But I think in that case, it, it, it works. But the point about the Newark footage of, of, the, of the rebellion in Newark, which happened the same summer, um, I was adamant about not using that because it was a, a specific to this, this city, so I think. So you're saying it's, if you do use it, just prepare to defend it if someone is like, hey, that's not. <laughs> I don't know, I think there would be different opinions, maybe Anne. Um, you know, it, it's um, you know, it's an aesthetic choice, but also it's as a director, it's how you position things. So if you're making a statement that um, in the summer of '69 there are lots of you know there are riots in Detroit and across the country, then of course you can show images from across the country. But if you if you um, are making a statement, let's say um, Pam has General um, uh, General Baker on the screen and he says. Um, on 27th Street, that was where the worst fire was, and then you show a fire from Detroit, then that's misleading. So you've got a little bit of leeway in that you can, if it's something, if it's a general statement, you know, like these protests are going on or this police brutality was happening, sure, you can use from, you, you can use your artistic license. But if someone is specifically saying that this is this person, this event, then, you know, you wouldn't, you, you don't want to be dishonest. You know, you want to be, yes, you're a director, yes, you're creative, but you're also a storyteller and you want to make sure that you're telling the story correctly. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just want to show you a couple slides of, of methods to organize um, material. This is, um, uh, I use, and uh, Milka uses file, uh, FileMaker Pro, and it allows you to have, a, have the image and, and, and keep track of all these different, uh, the information. Mm -hmm. uh, which one is that? Mm -hmm. So that you'll know the photo number, um, um, what your category is, uh, the source, the notes, notes on um, the quality, whether it's it's low resolution or it's the high resolution. You have notes on um, if you've liked <coughs> it already. Um, but this this costs. You can output this as an Excel, so you can do something. This is what the same, um, right? Go to one more slide oh, down. Yeah. yeah. So this is the same information, just exported as an Excel sheet. So this is something you can do without, um, you know, mm -hmm. using FileMaker Pro. That you just know you you're numbering. So I was using seven thousand for the, the footage and four thousand numbers for the stills and. So you're numbering, you're just keeping track of all this information, uh, where it came from, a subject, and, and really keep yourself organized you like that. The licensing fee from that quickly was total at the end when you're done, so you get an idea of what your budget is for that? You can do that. Yeah. I mean, this is a very time-consuming process, so it just depends on what kind of support you have. Um, you know, there's like very critical information and sort of metadata to get about a particular mm -hmm. image, like who's the photographer, what's your source, who the copyright holder is if you know it at the time, 
uh, maybe a brief description because whether it's a spreadsheet or if it's a, d a database, it's searchable. And if you're gathering enough material, so for um, the Wu-Tang Project, we had like 4,000 separate assets, you know what I mean? You need to, we're making our own archive in-house. We need to be able to navigate that. So if somebody says, oh, we need an image of them in 1993, you know, you, we can pull all of the 1993 or sort by year um, so that you're able to kind of, that it, these are going to be these flexible ways of understanding what you have um, through text. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, yeah. the basics of it, but it's really important that you are um, creating a system for logging this information. I mean, this was everything that I had found, and then we had another document of what we were going to use and the context and what we, that, that included the fees and you know updates on what they said and whether it was cleared or not. That didn't include all of these images. Mm -hmm. Maybe we, can we go quickly just to the slide twenty-four because I know folks want to need to um, go. And I just want to make sure that we talk about just permissions, mm -hmm. rights and clearances, and some of the legal questions that come into play. Right. Like yeah, 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 yes. So, so oh, go, mm -hmm. go ahead. So once you have the material that you're interested in um, using, um, there are a number of just kind of questions around. Um, there's really two factors. One is the quality of that, that, you know, you might have a working copy or you might have some low resolution copy and you might want to find a higher quality copy. That might, so that there's tracking that down. And then there's the issue of the right to use other people's work. Um, and so it will often involve licensing the material unless um, it's the, these two main categories that really pertain to, they're not, this is not, again, comprehensive, but this is, these are two main categories that pertain to um, filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, um, and one is this concept of public domain, the other is um, fair use. So copyright basically gives this sort of monopolistic right to control the distribution, the, 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 the performance of, the presentation of someone's original work. Um, and there are limitations to copyright. One is that it often is for a period of time, right? So there's a term that you have this kind of um, control over your intellectual property. Um, also, there are differences between countries. So copyright law is very specific to um, it's, it's country by country, so you want to be looking at the copyright law within the country where you are. Actually, it, it does get a little complicated, but in this case, you want to make sure that U.S. copyright law is what you're looking at. Um, and the other limitations are basically um, to this kind of like control of intellectual property are this question of public domain. When, when something expires from copyright or is, is now, is kind of phases out, um, it will fall into the public domain. And that is when you have access to use that material for any purpose. And I think that the general guideline for that is like the life of the author plus 70 years. But it gets very, very complicated because copyright has been, this law has been, has, has evolved over many, many years. And, um, there have been many different, um, we, we actually have a sheet up here that um, we can email or, or something. Oh, or wait, go back one. We could make, oh, well, we can see if we want to make this available. Yeah, Slides yeah. Available um, so just public domain, another important note about it is that um, federal government works are in the public domain. Um, and that is because, I, I, I believe it's because the idea is that it's, our taxes are, these are funded, you know, so that's why National Archives is a great resource for footage um, um, because oftentimes these are coming out of government agencies. We got this tremendous um, uh, film footage of the National Guard in Detroit um, be because of um, it's Army footage. Army so footage. We did have to pay for the copies, yes. okay? Right. You and it was film, and it had to be the transferred. The quality, okay. Yeah. The better quality you have to pay. But there wasn't a license. But there wasn't a license mm -hmm. to do that. Um, 
And then this concept of fair use, which I know people have heard a lot about, and, and, and let me just qualify this to say that we're not attorneys, and this is actually something that is really in the realm of law, like this is really like legal, um, legal constructs, legal understanding here. This is a, another exception um, or a limitation on um, intellectual property, like the rights to kind of control the use of your, your work. And basically, it allows limited use of copyrighted material without acquiring permission from the rights holder. Um, and I'll say this, it usually requires working with a fair use attorney, and it also usually requires errors and omissions insurance. <laughs> Um, and those are just two important things because it's not just something, it, it's not, it, it's sort of like, um, it's not something that you just want to say, oh, I'm fair using this and you think that you have a, a, a rationale, um, an argument that will support it. You really want to have, and this is actually when you get to the point of distributing your work, you really want to have the protection. You want to have an attorney who's evaluated your arguments and agrees with you and is willing to stand behind that. Um, and you also... For, for distribution, we'll need to have um, certain insurance in place, and one of them is going to be protecting your choice to make use of this fair use doctrine. And so what this fair use doctrine does is it basically is balancing or counterbalancing um, the rights of an individual property holder, an intellectual property holder, with the um, sort of desire to allow for an environment of new work to flourish, criticism, it's basically protecting satire and parody, you know, so that you're able to critique a work. Like you could not license um, uh, footage from Walt Disney if you were doing a takedown of Mickey Mouse, but that takedown on Mickey Mouse might be really important for the culture. And so as long as you're making a critique, um, the, the, the law basically says you have a right. You can't be kept from uh, making new work. Um, so there are these two, these two guiding questions here um, that are really important when you are evaluating fair use. Um, one is, are you transforming the work? Or, or are you just basically taking somebody else's material, property, and trying to kind of repurpose it for your own gain? Um, so you need to be, there needs to be some transformative quality to it. And then the other question is, how much of somebody else's work are you using? Are you taking the full um, Fantasia and then booking, bookending it? Or is it just like a, 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 a narrow, a, just enough to actually make your argument or to make your transformative work? I hear, um, I've heard like 30 seconds. Is that the number or if, if it justifies oh, what your no. use is? You okay. can, you can um, take a whole published work but if the context of your using it is transformative enough, do you know what I mean? Like, I, like in an art, like I, I, in like certain types of like performance art, um, and that can stand, that, that can be supported by fair use doctrine. You know what I mean? So it's, I don't think, it's probably going to be saying what's the smallest amount that you can use um, because they're, they're also, and this is argued I think case by case, um, the, the question is going to be, are you also undermining or, or kind of stealing from the person who made the original work and undermining their ability to kind of profit from their individual work? So it's, I think there's going to be kind of, I don't think there's a magic number. Okay. It's going to really be per case and per case in your film. Mm -hmm. um, how is it, how do you contextualize it? Are you making a critique? Are you trying to um, make a point or commentary on you know, but if you're using the work in, this, in the same way that it was used originally, you're pretty much just taking somebody's work. Okay. And that's... Okay, so I have a question. So I'm, I, I, one of the main reasons why I came here was for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this film that I'm doing now, uh, I, I'm talking about certain master drummers and, and uh, musicians from Guinea. And I've used uh, a couple of pieces just showing them, when I, when I referenced the Mamadi Keita playing for uh, Ballad Jolie, but I have um, uh, a film, uh, a clip from the film uh, Jinbei Fola, where he's performing for them, and then a few other same, similar examples, as well as some of the history of Guinea uh, 
with uh, the, uh, the emancipation of the country, the, in, in the independence, and whatever. So that's how I'm using it, and then mm -hmm. I've been cataloging it. And then, unfortunately, there's some clips that I did get from YouTube as my example. I'm still trying to research and find the source. But with fair use, you have to have it in your credits, correct? You have to have. Yes. You have to attribute, you, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to credit the, the, it's very important that you are not trying to disguise or, you know, that's part of mm -hmm. the requirement. Yeah. Um, so it does mean, it, you know, if it's fair use or not, you still have to track down. You have to do at least your best effort to track down mm -hmm. who the right. copyright holder is so you right. can properly credit them. Um, and basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other point, you know, nine times out of ten, you're, you're distributing your film, you have to pay for air submissions anyway, unless yeah. the broadcast company decides to do that. Unless, I dodged the bullet at one time, but but with using fair use, I'm assuming the premium uh, is going to be uh, the cost of that insurance is not going to be more, correct? Than just uh, no. Wait, oh. so, well, the cost okay. of the errors so, and omissions. So much, so you mean, much. will they charge you more for errors and omissions because you're yes. using fair use? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think so. Okay. I think the base, the the the, the insurance company is going to say, have there been any claims against you? And you have to answer that honestly, um, and and I think that's the basis. I don't think I. I, I, could, I could be the, wrong you about need the that. Fair I don't use know. Opinion letter from an attorney, which which I had that you have to pay pay for, um, and um, this this best this guide to um, best practices. Uh, done by the Center mm -hmm. for Media and Social Impact at American University is is a really good document. It's about 15 pages long, I think, and it was it's done by um, uh, intellectual property um, attorneys, media scholars, and independent filmmakers, and it was really it's it's really uh, extensive and, and useful. Um, you couldn't make a fair use claim, um, or you don't have an attorney who would stand by that. Um, but you want to license it. Just the quickly the term or length of a license, the territory, and sort of the distribution type. Those are going to be the variables that you're going to be negotiating, um, and that will determine the cost of the material. And and from at the very outset, you can get um, kind of the basic rate rate information from any archive that you want to license from and they're going to probably ask you well you know what are the terms that you want what kind of rights window how broad a window how narrow a window is it festival only is it all media worldwide perpetuity and and th that's the that's the spectrum and and um, obviously the broader the rights window you can get and that you can afford to um, license kind of the more flexibility you have and kind of the more shelf life that a film will have. It's also important that you license all of the individual pieces from all the different licensors um, in your film. You, you need the, the, the term to be the same because you don't want to have one, well, it's a real hassle if one piece of footage falls out of license and it will kind of arrest your use of the whole film. Um, unless you can go back in and swap it out, or unless um, you can renegotiate with that, that archive. Um, so you kind of want to figure out and start to figure out budgeting um, what kind of rights window. Oftentimes people do a festival only um, uh, license because it's cheaper and, and negotiate what the terms, what, what the licensing fee would be should they go back and want to kind of broaden the rights window. Um, Advertising and promotion, promotional use adds a tremendous amount, as does theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, one question, one more question. Yeah. Uh, when, it came, uh, t when it comes to licensing for a festival, um, I don't know if it was at the uh, 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 meeting that we had last, because we had the, the attorney from uh, 20 Feet from Stardom, and oh. she talked about how they, the whole film was fair use. I don't, mm. know if it, I don't know if it was from that particular meeting, but I, I was at one place where they yeah. said, uh, he said he never uh, pays for licensing for film festival because he says I haven't really decided if I'm going to mm. use everything. I might change it and this, that, and the other. That's something I can say. And I was wondering if that's something you've heard or whatever. I rocked it once. I've got to admit. I have not. <laughs> I have not heard of that. Okay. 
I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I did it once. So, yeah. um, it's super important that you have a license agreement. And then if you're going to budget for a film, um, there's, these are some two numbers that you can keep in mind. $90 per second of footage, $300 per photo. But understand that there is a huge range within that. There are going to be archives that will charge you $5 a photo. And there'll be other archives that will charge you, you know, a thousand if, if it's a, you know, a fancy photographer or more, you know. Um, so, yeah. So we hope that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs>